Welcome to Practical Trauma Lessons. So this program <clears throat> is uh, basically um, a bunch of lessons that I took from a pre-hospital trauma life support class that I recently attended. And although this doesn't go into the actual material taught in the class, if you haven't taken PHTLS <clears throat> and you're in EMS, highly, highly recommended program. It's a really, really good program regardless if you're BLS or ALS or somewhere in between. The, um, <clears throat> this, this presentation is um, basically one of the things I found fascinating in the program was you get a lot of people with a variety of different backgrounds and during the classroom time or during breaks, you get to hear a lot of great stories, but more importantly, you get a lot of um, kind of best practices. And so I took a, an amazing amount of notes and decided to share them with all of you. Um, the instructor from my PHTLS class was amazing, a paramedic out of uh, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas here in New Jersey, and really, really uh, amazing uh, instructor, um, and uh, what I would consider a really great coach and mentor. So with that, let's go ahead and, and jump into this, uh, <clears throat> this presentation. So, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, these, these, these are lessons, notes, quips, and they're in no particular order. Just kind of stream of consciousness. I tried to group them as best I could. Hopefully, you found them, find them to be uh, of interest. Um, they're they're ultimately what I've collected here are meant to be little gems, right? Things that you can remember when you know the going gets rough, and or simply when you're bored uh, and you don't have anything else to do and you want to kind of think of something. Maybe you'll start thinking of this stuff. It'd be kind of weird if you ask me, but hey, you know, everybody, no judgment. Um, these the information in this presentation will definitely help you impress your fellow EMS colleagues. It will definitely help you get promoted. It's going to stump clinicians. Imagine you walk into the trauma center, you throw out one of these little gems in this presentation. You are going to have the chief trauma surgeon be like, oh my gosh, that dude or dudette really knows their stuff. I could learn something from them. Most importantly, you post this stuff on Tinder, TikTok, Facebook, wherever you may peruse social media, you're going to get a date with that person who's caught your eye, guaranteed. Or maybe not. Maybe none of that's true. The point is, um, this is meant to be fun. So just relax, chill out, and, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe grab a snack, grab a beverage, throw on some comfortable clothes, you know, maybe some pajamas, um, and um, just, just relax, right? This is meant to be a kind of a fun tour. We are going to cover some very serious material, so it's not a bunch of jokes or anything. It's Actually, really good material that I picked up in this program and uh, really made me start thinking about, um, you know, how do I up my game a bit? And hopefully this helps you up your game. Also, this is about real trauma. So we're talking about, you know, multi-system trauma, serious trauma situations. Um, you know, <clears throat> you know, a kind of, uh, you know, back in the day kind of trauma stuff, right? Um, but no, really, this is uh, what we're talking about here. You know, if you're dealing um with uh i don't want to say less serious trauma is there ever such a thing but the point of this is is when you're dealing with serious trauma situations as i mentioned multi-system uh this probably the, the 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 information in this deck um is going to help you um really kind of make a difference in that patient's life at least i believe i'm sticking to that story you may have some other gems other ideas feel free to put them in the comments below um, contribute what you've learned, some of the, the life lessons you have. Um, and then ultimately, keep in mind the most important lesson here of all lessons, no matter what you may think, if you agree with the stuff in this uh, deck or you disagree or you do something different, most important lesson for all of us in the world of EMS, regardless of what tier we're on, is focus on your patient and solve the case, right? Focus on the patient at all times. So with that, let's jump into this. Like I said, it's not really <clears throat> in any real order. Uh, some of this you're going to find either humorous or or somewhat controversial. But again, my hope here, my goal is that you you learn, you question, question yourself, question your practices, and keep growing. So let's jump into it. So this first section here probably going to upset a few uh, people, you know. Um, but I think there's a reason for all this madness that you're about to witness, and I'll explain that. Uh, and that is this. Let's just admit it. God has created and made paramedics simply so EMTs could have a hero. I don't really believe that. But I will tell you this. I am on a lot of calls. So in my EMS career, which spans several decades, 
with a huge gap in between the start of my career and my current career in EMS. Um, I've probably done well over 200, 250 calls, which may not be a lot for a lot of you, but again, I had a big gap between the start of my career and where I am today. Um, and things were a lot different in the past <clears throat> than they are today in this current uh, iteration of my career. And what I will see, one of the big things today is that um, a lot of EMTs, EMRs um, that I interact with and work with seem to have this kind of belief, like, let's just call the paramedics. Uh, and maybe in your part of the world, that's not the case, and you kind of have a different view of how paramedics are used. Uh, but I think that if paramedics are available, we tend to over-rely on them. And that's not meant to, to, to be a negative in terms of paramedics. I think paramedics have a, a great role, but typically they're far and few between in many many of the jurisdictions that we work in and many of the, the regions we work in. And so I wanted to put together some notes that came out of the class I took that may help us with, you know, thinking about paramedics a little bit differently. And most importantly, how do we use them as a really cool resource that, you know, ultimately can make a huge difference. And I, so let me go through this. Please understand, again, I'm just joking around with the image here. Ultimately, my hope is that, you know, as a profession, we start thinking more about how do we get uh, the best use of paramedics at the right time uh, for the right patient. <clears throat> so first thing I would tell you is treat every call as if the paramedics are not coming. Uh, I see a lot of times where people are focusing on patient movement, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of um, the old school uh, scoop and run kind of stuff because we know in the back of our mind, like, got to get the paramedics here. The paramedics will be here soon. We're going to intercept the paramedics. And ultimately, I think patient care suffers. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have expediency in your patient movement if you have a critical patient. What it does mean is do not start or go into the call um, by thinking in the back of your mind, we'll be fine as soon as the paramedics get here. You know, focus on the patient. The paramedics may or may not show up, but if you take this position of, you know what, paramedics may not come you will see a dramatic improvement in the quality of the patient care that you provide. I guarantee it. Um, the second thing is, think about this. There is advanced life support at the hospital. Everything the paramedics can do for you can be done in the hospital. And so, you know, yes, moving with expediency is important. Getting your patient into a, pro giving your patient a proper foundation of care is critical. So if you think about, hey, the paramedics may not come, so let's do everything we can to possibly provide this patient a strong foundation of care, right? Because everything else is going to build on that foundation of care. We establish a foundation of care at the BLS level, then ALS is going to be much more effective. And we don't have to worry about figuring out how to augment the failure of that foundation if we do it right. Uh, and so think about that. If you can get that foundation built, move with somewhat some expediency, and get the patient to the hospital rather than wait for paramedics, um, you're going to get that patient the ALS care that they deserve and they need, right? So just a different way to think about it, right? Um, <clears throat> the other thing is a paramedic unit is, and I think this was a great, great kind of eye-opening thing for me, is ultimately when you think about what a paramedic unit can do uh, across most uh, ge uh, geographies in this country, in the U.S., they are a level four trauma center, right? And so... Uh, if you think about this in terms of timing and uh, expediency on scene and establishing that patient care foundation, you know you may you may think that you know if I can get this patient to a level three trauma center uh, sooner than waiting for the paramedics to show, or I can get them to a level two or a level one, right, which are kind of interchangeable. But the point of that is you need to evaluate: is waiting for this pa uh, the paramedic unit to arrive a better option than getting to the trauma center? And when we're dealing with multi-system uh, multi trauma, uh, severe trauma situations, um, we need to really evaluate that very clearly. And so think about, you know, if you want a real clean way of understanding what you're doing, you're basically bringing a level four trauma center to the patient. Um, if you can get them to a level three or two, or one obviously, um, sooner than get to those trauma centers. Again, ALS is at the hospital. Um, so it's just something to think about in terms of, how you can prioritize your 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 plan, right? Your 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 management plan. The <clears throat> other thing is, a lot of times when we call paramedics, you know, the paramedics are going to just practice what we call care bear medicine, right? And this is simply when the paramedics really 
there's not much more they can do than what we've done or what you could do uh, in a BLS setting. Uh, so they're going to kind of look concerned and say some smart things, but other than that, there's not much you can do. Now, this is really important to understand when we in, uh, bring in the physiology of trauma. Uh, there's a lot, and we'll talk on some of these things, but a lot of things that if you do take the PHTLS course, um, you're going to find that a lot of the assumptions we make about how trauma is treated um, you know, is really the most success that we can create in a trauma in, uh, patient is a BLS foundation. Right? That doesn't mean that ALS is not critical. Obviously, it is. But a lot of the ALS, a lot of the advanced care that needs to be done for a trauma patient is going to be done in the trauma center. And the paramedics really act as a bridge to that. So, you know, one of the big things that paramedics can do for a trauma patient is intubation. Uh, but we'll talk about things like fluid replacement cause, and, and, and dealing with hypovolemia and things like that um, in, in, in the next slide. So just think about, you know, are you calling the paramedics because it's going to make you feel good, right? You have to back up on scene, and that may be valid, uh, or, or are you better off uh, establishing a BLS foundation and expediently moving that patient in a professional manner uh, to a higher level of care? So let's talk about focusing on the patient and, and, and thinking about that from a trauma perspective, what we're trying to do. Um, now, a lot of this is geared towards BLS because that BLS foundation is so critical to the survival of that, that, that critical trauma patient. So one thing to keep in mind, a trauma patient, pretty much any patient, obviously, but especially trauma patients, don't just suddenly deteriorate. We may think they do, but typically it's that we fail to notice the subtle changes. Now, typically trauma is going to be done in, uh, we're going to encounter trauma patients in chaotic environments, right? Uh, in the alley, in the street, in a car that's overturned, uh, you know, some type of chaotic environment. Not always, but a lot of times, right? Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, immediate panic and emotion from the family members or bystanders. We have to kind of get that out of our heads and focus on this patient. And we do need to look at those subtle changes that are occurring in our patient. Uh, there are small little clues, and if you're not focused on the patient, uh, you're going to miss those changes, right? You're going to look away. You're going to be more concerned about something somebody's telling you uh, or a question somebody's asking because they're interrupting what you're saying. And ultimately, that's going to be the pieces that lead to that, what we believe is a sudden deterioration. But they, more, you know, patients just don't suddenly deteriorate, right? They, they, it, it could happen very quickly, but it's not instantaneous. And we, the earlier we can spot those trends, the better. So that brings me to vital signs. You should absolutely get baseline vitals. But here's where you need to evaluate. Are secondary vitals critical to you establishing patient care? Um, <clears throat> you know, we're going to talk about secondary vitals in a moment, but the big takeaway here, and I think most people know this, is you know, secondary vitals um, are only important if you have time, right? The question to ask in terms of am I going to take secondary vitals is, is there something I can be doing uh, that will be better for this patient in, instead of getting the vitals, right? My second set of vitals. Um, and so <clears throat> think about what intervention you want to develop or hopefully it put in place that will start to stop that deterioration, right? That, that keeps you from having that patient deteriorate. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, right? We, if we have time for the vitals, secondary vitals, take them. How do we know we have time? Because you're saying to yourself, is there anything I can be doing to this patient to help improve them? And if there is, go do that instead of doing your secondary vitals, okay? Now, <clears throat> one thing to think about with vitals, I think a lot of times we get really caught up on the numbers of vitals and they're important, but what we're really using vital signs for is to be a scorecard. If you are getting a second set of vitals, it's a comparison, and we may think that's an obvious lesson. And you're like, oh, yeah, of course, John. But a lot of us are just charting that information, noting it. But what we really need to do is study the vitals. We need to understand that, you know, the vital, the, the vital signs are basically a scorecard of our performance as the caregiver. It's important. It's not about, you know, you got to be careful here, some subtlety. Like, it, it's not so much about what the <clears throat> patient's doing, it's about or what we doing, is that being effective? If you think about that differently, you'll start to understand like, okay, the vitals are basically my, my dashboard to this patient. 
And that, again, may sound very obvious, but I think we forget that in the, the stress and chaos of trauma. So what we're ultimately trying to figure out here is, you know, either the patient's doing better or worse and means that I am doing better or worse. So either the patient's winning or they're dying. That's it. I know it's kind of a, you know, in your face statement, but the vital signs are a scorecard. And so if you're going to get secondary vitals, use them in order to tell you if what you are doing is doing is doing something effective for this patient or not. Are you improving them? So we can halt that, that what we believe to be sudden deterioration, right? When you're setting priority for this patient, we need to go beyond transport decisions. I think a lot of times, uh, especially in most EMT programs, you're taught what's the patient priority, what's the patient priority. W yes, transport is obviously critical to discuss in terms of our patient priority. We get off the scene in 10 minutes and yada, yada, yada. But priority should also help dictate the type of assessment we're doing. Right now, obviously, depending on the type of uh, the MOI, we're going to do a head to toe assessment, but we need to think about are there other assessments I need to be doing in conjunction with that rapidly and effectively. Right. Uh, so types of assessment need to be really thought about as part of the priority here. And this comes from your, your vital signs, whether it's baseline, secondary or trending. You need to be establishing based on what I'm seeing in this scorecard. What do I need to be assessing? Right. You know, I do. Do I need to reassess airway? Oh, I need to reassess circulation. Am I missing something from a bleeding perspective? Right. So that scorecard is going to drive the prioritization of your assessment type because it's a system-based assessment. As you start seeing your your score your scorecard either evolve or uh, or or not evolve, right? Kind of start going in the tank. And then ultimately is how you're managing this patient overall. Like what is your patient care plan? That should also be considered how you're going to prioritize patient care. And this may seem obvious again, but we really need to make some very clear decisions on patient care priorities around, you know, are we going to splint? Are we going to move? Are we going to just focus on airway management? What's my priority in the moment? Uh, and a lot of times, especially with, uh, you know, if you have multiple people on scene trying to care for the patient, this becomes some sort of contentious. We have multiple people trying to address multiple problems. Uh, we have to be very careful of that. And one of the big things to do here is take a lesson from a trauma center. When you go to a trauma center, everybody has a job and they stick in that swim lane. and That's their job. And the jobs are decided well before the patient's ever encountered. And people become really good at that job. Uh, versus everybody just picking what they want to do, which leads to patient deterioration uh, and that sudden kind of deterioration, which shouldn't occur because we should be able to notice the signs, back that up with our vital signs, our dashboard, and then prioritize care. Right. A big one here, and for some of you, you may be wondering, well, you know, how, how is no people don't call the hospital? Uh, it's critical that when you have a trauma patient, you give that trauma center a heads up as to what you got coming in. And this is important, uh, you know, uh, little things like estimating the amount of bleed, um, <clears throat> you know, time of unconsciousness for the patient, if possible, all the little signs. This helps develop a preliminary treatment plan at the trauma center. So it's not just about advising the trauma center so they can kind of get their gowns on and their masks and get ready. Uh, it's about them helping to formulate a treatment plan, a preliminary treatment plan. And the more accurate you can be, the more evidence you can provide them, the better. Um, you know, some things like vital signs may be important if you're on the ALS side and you need to, you're calling for, for drug orders or intubation orders. But from the BLS side, yeah, vital signs are important once maybe you get there. But more than likely, what's important are some of the, the environmental factors around how much blood did the patient have uh, loss, right? Uh, patient height and weight, patient <clears throat> sizing, uh, level of consciousness, those type of things, GCS, uh, you know, is the patient exhibiting flexion extension, motor uh, response. Those things are probably more critical because they help the trauma center start thinking about preliminary planning, preliminary treatment plan, preliminary resource planning, and all of that ultimately is what's going to make a huge difference in your patient. And all of this is the foundation of care that we talked about, right? All right, so <clears throat> let's just keep moving through this. Patient management. So this is kind of where we're going to start crossing into some of the, maybe some of the things that you may have thought were hard and fast rules about trauma and actually have changed a lot in the last three years, uh, especially if you go through PHTLS. Uh, so let's start with fluid management. You know, one of the big things, and I think one of the reasons a lot of us do call paramedics is our patient has lost, you know, blood or is hypovolemic. And so our thinking is, well, we got to get the paramedics here so we can get them fluids. Now, fluid management is essential uh, and important 
but the latest research in evidence-based medicine is showing that uh, fluid management is, is for trauma patients is secondary and a lot of times often contraindicated. Now, the reason for this is about 20%, there's a 20% increase in mortality when we attempt to increase fluids. And, and there's a lot of science behind this. And if you really want to get all the, the background in that, you should look into some of the PHTLS stuff, some of the TTCC stuff, some of the tactical medicine stuff. Uh, and you'll find that, yeah, fluids are important, but we want to keep, uh, you know, kind of at the 80 to 90 mmHg in terms of our fluid management, which is a little bit sometimes hard to do in a trauma patient. There's a lot of reasons that we don't want to do clot busting, a whole bunch of stuff. But if you're in a BLS space and you're waiting on paramedics because you need, you're thinking, we've got to get this guy on IVs or like paramedics and give him some IVs, you need to think twice about that with a, with a, a serious trauma patient. Second thing is just keep inside in your mind some of the physiology here. Pretty much any of the fluids that you give a patient from an ALS perspective is going to dilute the blood, right? And what I mean by that is you think of the pathology of the blood, and when you add fluid to it, you know, we're going to thin out that blood. We're going to get it, it's going to become, you know, to the lack of technical terms here, and we're all friends, it's going to become more watery. Uh, now, is are electrolytes and, and, and sodium and other things important? Yes, they are, and they do help with cell perfusion and, and those types of things, but in the grand scheme of the trauma patient, our big thing is to stop the bleeding, right? Uh, the only thing that can really help us with that is more blood. And where's the blood? Typically, it's not going to be <clears throat> in a paramedic unit. Now, if you have uh, emergency uh, physician responders, they may carry blood with them. So you need to know your local protocols on that. But ultimately, where is the blood? Typically, it's at the trauma center. So again, this is where you need to think about what am I expecting if you're calling ALS for them to do? Right? Or should I get this patient to that trauma center? Because ultimately, we need to control the bleeding, replace volume with blood. Um, again, I don't want anybody to take away from this, and we're not saying, I'm not saying that you should not uh, utilize fluids and do perform fluid management. Uh, but on the other hand, you need to start moving towards where the blood is, and typically, again, trauma center. Fractured long bones, they and cavity trauma is your enemy, right? If you have patients with fractured long bones, um, you really need to be thinking about internal bleeding and the challenges that that creates to your patient and the foundation you're trying to establish. You know, if a patient's deteriorating, um, you know, think about those internal injuries if there's nothing obviously uh, observant, you know, from the external side of the world. If you go to donate blood, you're probably donating somewhere around 500 milliliters. And if you think about this, um, you know, if you donate 500 milliliters of blood, what do you want? You want something. You, you're, you're, you're feeling like you're dizzy. They warn you to not to get up quickly. They're going to try and shove a three-day-old donut in you, maybe give you some fake orange juice. But ultimately, they're trying to help you, right, to kind of replenish that blood loss uh, in some way, shape, or form, right, and kind of keep you, keep you okay until the body can recover. So think about, like, when you have a fractured humerus, your, your patient can lose up to or more than 750 milliliters. So you're above the donor level, right? You're above what somebody is going to donate in a blood drive. Uh, same thing if we get into traumatic chest injury. You could lose somewhere around three liters. So you need to really think about, you know, if we have to, if we have a patient that is bleeding or internally or externally, and, and we're estimating blood loss here, and this is a critical, right, one of these critical things we need to communicate to that trauma center, we have a high loss of blood. Um, it's important for you to keep in mind that ultimately we got to get this patient blood. Uh, and I don't think we talk about this enough. Uh, obviously, we could try to create that bridge between the pre-hospital and hospital environment with some fluid management, but the most important thing we got to do is get this patient blood. Um, and typically, again, that's going to happen in, in the trauma center. You know, look, if, here's a real easy lesson. It was kind of cool. I heard some, some of the team at the, that attended this program say this. If God made the hole, don't plug it, right? Uh, but if God didn't make the hole, plug the damn hole. A lot of us, I think, are you know, second-guessing kind of should we plug or shouldn't we plug a hole. And I think this, this kind of little you know, philosophical approach to it is pretty 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 easy way to settle that debate. If God didn't make the hole, get the hole plugged, right? Um, you know, we got to focus on X, A, B, C, D, right? So, you know, our big thing is get the bleeding under control. Once we have bleeding under control, all the physiological systems can hopefully continue to come back online. And rather than have that subtle but sometimes rapid 
uh, deterioration, we can put that and stop it. We can build that foundation. That's the biggest job we have with trauma patients, build the foundation. And then, you know, create that foundational scaff the scaffolding that the ALS and trauma teams can then build upon. Uh, so hopefully that's a little monomic that helps you. If somebody's shot, stabbed, or penetrated in the chest, they're going to probably code. Um, so get ready, right? Thinking about your patient management plan should include what do I need to put in place? What do I need to have ready in the event that this patient continues to crash on me or dump on me? Uh, so, you know, having things like your AED unzipped, ready to go, doesn't mean you have to place the pads on the patient, having them ready, right? Um, thinking about, <clears throat> you know, what else do I need here? If that, if I plug the hole, do I need a second and third, um, <clears throat> you know, hemostatic uh, dressing? Uh, you know, I've placed one tourniquet on, should I get a second one ready to go? These are things that save time. You know, often we work when we're dealing with trauma patients, way too often I, I see situations or I've seen situations where we're kind of in this uh, waterfall method. Put on the tourniquet, let's evaluate, and oh, whoa, it's not working. Okay, let me get another tourniquet, right? You, know, you can evaluate whether the first tourniquet's working and getting your second tourniquet ready. And even if that means just on, you know, you know, getting it out of your bag, opening it, ready to apply, you know, you can lay it on a patient's shoulder. So if boom, you're seeing that there's a problem, you go right to that tourniquet and you get it there, right? You don't have to wait till you, you know, see that it's completely not working to go fish it out and get it set up. Seconds matter when we're dealing with this, right? We're fighting that enemy, that, that subtle change, right? We're fighting, you know, <clears throat> don't let the bastard win by ending up with a bunch of subtle changes that deteriorate your patient. Take every little chance you can to win. All right, let's keep it going. I want to kind of wrap this up soon. Um, you know, if you have cerebral spinal fluid, I think we all know this, but that is a definitive sign of ICP, right? You do need the paramedics at that point. You need to get this patient intubated. Uh, one of the most important things we could do with ICP is maintain CO2 levels, right? This is a critical situation. So if you have head trauma, uh, skull fracture, you have hemorrhagic strokes, anything of that nature, the most important thing we can do in this situation is get that CO2 under control, right? And for a variety of physiological reasons, uh, we need to get this under control. And you're not going to be doing that at the BLS level. This is a really serious time to get the, the ALS guys and, and girls uh, on the scene. They're not going to be doing the Care Bears, looking smart kind of stuff. No Care Bear medicine at this point. They're going to be doing what they do really, really well, right? Uh, so think about that. Uh, same thing with seizure, ongoing seizures, um, anything resulting from head trauma, this is where you want to get ALS uh, in route as quickly as possible. Uh, head trauma is, is not something we can build a very strong foundation on with BLS. We can help manage airway. We can help improve hypoxia. Uh, we can do a bunch of things. We can uh, hopefully battle off aspiration, but ultimately we got to get the, the CO2 levels managed, and we can't do that very well. So big one for, for us is get a, a ALS online. Uh, yeah, ALS on, online on scene. This is the big one where, yes, you need to do that. But again, think about what if paramedics aren't coming, right? Even though you've called them, and this is a great reason to call them, <clears throat> and you still need to think in your back of mind, what's my alternative plans here? What am I going to do if I can't get paramedics, right? Again, we need to manage with controlled expediency, right? We need to make sure we can continue to support this patient. And what are our alternatives? What are our transport alternatives? What's our patient management priorities? What's our plan? What's our backups? Another monomic, pretty straightforward. Keep moist stuff moist, dry stuff dry. When we're thinking of dressings and bandages, you know, if God made it moist to begin with in the body, probably needs to be maintained moist. If God made it dry to begin with, chances are we should keep it dry. So just something to think about when you're dealing with dressings. Um, <clears throat> Here's a big one, preliminary lung sounds in a trauma patient. You know, we already have a chaotic environment. We're trying to maintain our and manage our scene time effectively. We're trying to do the, as much as we can. We're constantly with trauma patients, we're trying to get the greatest return on investment for everything we do. We're trying to get that greatest return on investment. And one way on preliminary, when you're getting preliminary lung sounds, you don't need to get sound, you know, do a full set of lung sounds. 
Uh, in fact, one great practice I took away from the program I, 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 I went to uh, is just taking um, uh, lateral mid-axillary side lung sounds on each side of the uh, rib cage uh, on the lateral mid-axillary line. And really, this is a great place to take preliminary lung sounds. You're going to hear, if there's fluid, you're going to hear absence of breath sounds, you're going to hear depth of uh, exchange. So this is a quick way to ascertain. The other thing here is if you uh, for, if you're uh, dealing with a situation where the patient's in cardiac arrest, you have AED pads on, you know, you're not going to do full set of lung sounds. You may want to evaluate lung sounds after ROSC. Uh, so great place is on the sides, right? Uh, you may have chest trauma, right? Open chest wounds, things of that nature. Where are you going to take your lung sounds? So on the sides. Now, obviously, if the patient's been punctured or, or injured to the side, you may need to find an alternative. But typically, you're going to be able to get your preliminary lung sounds off the patient's um, side lateral mid-axillary lines. It works really, really well. Medic alert tags. This is kind of changed, and this is one. This is just something I wanted to throw in here. Uh, uh, it was eye-opening to me, and that is that we're seeing a lot of different types of medic alert tags. We, I think a lot of us are looking for that, you know, silver pendant with the red star, uh, star of life. <clears throat> and what we're seeing now is sometimes you'll see a crucifix. If you turn it over, it'll have. Uh, the, the allergy information. Uh, we're seeing uh, pendants and lockets that you actually have to open up, and inside of that is a family member photo and the allergy information. Uh, we're seeing anklets, cool little anklets that people can wear that have little lockets on them. So again, you need to think about when you're assessing your patients, is, you know, are, are we looking for that traditional medic alert tag, or are we looking for alternative custom medical alert tags that are becoming much, much more prevalent in this day and age? So just something to think about. Um, NPAs, you know, they're basically free, right? Uh, you know, they don't interrupt, uh, they don't have an issue with gag reflex. Uh, there's very, very few contraindications, and even the contraindications that we know of uh, are being debated, and, and you know, we're, we're starting to question the, the evidence behind them. So get an NPA in. If you got a trauma patient, um, you know, get an NPA in them. Uh, it should be one of the first things you go for, right, uh, after controlling that bleeding. And if you're dealing, if you're in a situation where you have multiple providers, then break up the work, right? One person manage breathing, another one get that airway patent and, and keep moving. But NPAs, they're free. They're your friend, right? They're, they, they, they're easy to do um, and they work, right? <clears throat> and you can do two of them, right? You can get two of them in there and get, two, uh, get a greater return on your investment. I want to talk about something that I call the opioid of EMS, and I see sometimes when we have critical patients, but especially trauma patients, almost every patient actually, man, do we love this opioid uh, as EMS providers. So, you know, we just, oh man, I, I don't know what we did before we had this, but man, does it make us feel so good, like we're doing really cool stuff, right? It's like, let me get this, let me get this, and well, it's kind of crazy, right? This opioid the data from it can be almost two minutes old, right? We're actually making patient care decisions, establishing our foundation by which we're going to build the ALS scaffolding on with data that could be almost two minutes old. Another thing about this opioid is it gets fooled pretty easily, right? Carbon monoxide and, oh yeah, blood disorders can throw off the readings, right? Giving us a false scorecard of our patient. And nobody really calibrates them, right? If you have one of these opioids that I'm talking about here, who calibrates this thing every day, right? Glucometers and other devices that we have that we use for patient care typically have to be calibrated on some form of schedule and checked against the baseline and ensure that the device is still continually managing against that baseline. You know, you know obviously we're talking here about pulse oxes, and I don't know many people calibrating their pulse ox or even how you establish baselines, right? Uh, but maybe there's a way, or maybe you have a more sophisticated one, but most that I know of are purchased at Walgreens, CVS, or Walmart. Uh, you know, you're making patient care decisions. This critical foundation we're trying to build, you know, is being based on something you got at Walmart. Um, that's kind of goofy. It also may not work, and some of these we already know, right? If you got nail polish, calluses, blisters, swelling, burns, open wounds, abrasions, deformities, and oh yeah, circulatory issues. So ultimately, it's kind of silly, right? You're, you're trying to determine a pulse ox level on a trauma patient who may have one or all of these situations. And if they're already shocked, you know, their pulse ox is probably the least of your issues. It's reversing shock and managing shock effectively, which depending if you're BLS or ALS, you've got certain protocols you need to follow. One of which is not really what is the pulse ox, right? 
Uh, now, you're, some of you are going to say, well, we need to know. Is it above 94, 95 or not? How are they saturating? Uh, you know what? Uh, here's some friendly advice. Focus on XABC, right? Uh, I will tell you this. If you establish the patient's respiratory rate, depth, and pattern, which is what we used to do before we ever got pulse ox and as very, very effective, you will be able to un not have to worry about saturation. You will fix saturation, uh, oxygen saturation levels uh, automatically, right? Focus on their respiratory rate, depth, and pattern, right? Their respiratory rate, depth, and pattern does not get affected because you have somebody with nail polish on, right? Or they have blisters. In fact, it will tell you the exact thing you're trying to figure out. So if you are going to use the pulse ox, if you're you know, kind of trying to, to control this opioid that you have on relying on the pulse ox and it's making you feel oh so very good and like you really know what's going on with the patient, then at least create a rule in your mind that every time I take a pulse ox, I have to get respiratory rate, depth, and pattern. And that way, if the pulse ox is off, if it's wrong, you're going to have a real baseline that's based on your personal observation of that patient in the moment. And if we go back to this concept, the patients don't suddenly deteriorate. You're getting the data that goes to your dashboard so you can understand how you're dealing with this patient. Now, let me explain something to you. One of the reasons patients deteriorate, because you're focused on the pulse ox and the data is two minutes old. And by the time you find out that that patient, that what you saw on that little, little, little screen that we see is not accurate, the patient's deteriorated, right? So you're better off really honestly looking at respiratory rate, depth, and pattern. Use that as your litmus to determine is this pulse ox actually makes sense to me or not. Uh, the other thing here is whenever you feel like using pulse ox, you know, if you're going to reassess pulse ox, then reassess also rate, depth, and pattern, right? It's just that rule. Again, every time you do pulse ox, do rate, depth, and pattern. Now, don't get caught in the trap that if you don't do pulse ox, you don't do rate, depth, and pattern. Hopefully, you're going to always get, you're going to get, hopefully, you're getting the message here, which is, hey, pulse ox should be secondary to rate, depth, and pattern, especially in a trauma patient, especially when we're dealing with critical trauma patients that we are fighting against that deterioration. We are fighting to establish that foundation, get them to a point where we can assure that everything else beyond that is going to be effective, right? Because we don't have that foundation then ALS and trauma centers really can't build upon that. And in fact, they're going to spend a lot of time trying to get that foundation in place that you should have done as the BLS provider um, before anybody else you know, was on scene with you or you got the patient to the trauma center. Um, you know, honestly, if, if you're really that attached to Pulse Ox, try Pulse Ox Anonymous. They have some great things they do, really can help you step back away from the crack, um, you know, and, and really kind of reorient you back to some good old fashioned vitals right, that tell us exactly what the patient's doing, guess what, right now, and then you can take an intervention. All right, so with that, I hope this was helpful, probably went a little longer than I wanted, uh, just a lot of kind of collection of, of, of just, maybe it's all nonsense, I don't know, but I'm hoping it kind of gets your juices flowing, puts things in a little bit different light, uh, and inspires you to learn. You know, even if you decide everything I said is wrong, then at least you're learning and you're growing. Um, but you know what? Um, it all comes from the heart. I hope it makes a difference for you, and I truly appreciate your time. Um, you know, if you have tidbits, suggestions, things that work for you in the field, let's keep it positive. Place some stuff in the comment. Share this with others in the field. We're all a community. At the end of the day, you know, it truly takes a village. Thank you for everything you guys do day to day. Be safe.